saves it. Get right with you. Hallelujah. Amen. So we've got these promises. Life promises. And, and the Holy God looked at the supernatural report. Amazing promises, but they come with conditions. And Scripture warns us of this parting of the ways of those that would try to come against the Lord's supernatural church in the end times. As, as um, David had quoted earlier of um, 2 Timothy 4 3, he said, um, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines. But after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So you can become quite popular, as we've observed, it, it, it appears, if you just tell people what they want to hear. Just, but, yeah, to, to preach what's um, you know, necessary for believers. Um, this is kind of idea out there today. That um, all your sins are just automatically forgiven when you come to the Lord. So it's not necessary for, you know, once you get saved, it's not necessary to, to come back to the Lord after you mess up again and say, sorry. But there's really that kind of atmosphere in a lot of the modern uh, churches today, sadly. We see in 2 Timothy 2.1, God, therefore, my son, be strong in thy grace, in thy, that is, in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangles himself in the affairs of this life, but that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. When we've been called to, to battle the enemy of our souls, and, and that means enduring some difficult times, everybody here is under difficult times now as a soldier of Christ. There's, there's some suffering that in training the soldiers discover. And we've been called to be good soldiers. Amen? So, it doesn't mean to get entangled in civilian affairs, um, but rather we try to, to please our commanding officer, simply obeying his instructions. So I see the pastor's job, really the description of the pastor in the scriptures here, is primarily to correct people. And, and when they're heading down the wrong pathway, to encourage true repentance. Because all preachers of the gospel are commended of the Lord to preach repentance. Understanding that, that healing, restoration begins with sanctification of the heart. We, we, we've seen the scriptures says in Luke 13 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Mm. So it's, in, it's indeed a, you know, it's a true, as you study the, the Holy Word of God, to show yourself approved. I mean, there's no, just numerous verses all through the scriptures that, that, that the promises of salvation. And, and, and yet, we see, I mean, you, you can find scriptures, I mean, that's what's going on here. You can find scriptures that don't actually mention repentance. But you've got to read the entire book. Okay? We, we, I mean, because we get, this is what's going on in, in the modern church. We got like Acts 16 31, and, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Or another example be um, Romans 10 9, I hear that a lot, right? That thou, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But see, we're, we're called to be Berean. Make sure and search the scriptures daily, make sure that's what it's really saying. Um, 2 Timothy 2.25 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Of course again in Acts 17.11 These were more noble than those in Thessalonians. 
and that they receive the word with all readiness of mind. They search the scriptures daily whether those things be so. So because we clearly we see that sin, the sins and iniquities in our life, in all generations, they're playing out. And, and they're hindering us, or they're separating us from, from blessings and the promises of God. And there's many professing believers in the body of Christ that, you know, they've got a very worldly perspective, and sadly they've been, they've been taught, they've been programmed that once you're saved, you're free from the influences of the kingdom of darkness. I mean, you're dealing with these believers every day, and we all encounter them. Um, it, it's kind of, it, I, but the other part of it is, you know, they're not interested in the Old Testament. Because they think it's no longer valid, because we're under a new, that's a covenant, right? So, um, what did they do with verses where Jesus said things like, in Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. So what, what do we do with that? I mean, under Moses, things like adultery and murder were, were against the law. In the New and Better Covenant, they're still against the law. So how can God bless you in your sins? Since all sins separate you from God. I mean, even the spirit of fear separates you, because then now you're bowing down to something and you're saying that thing you're fearing is greater than God to deliver you. And God being a gentleman steps back uh, to heaven your way until you decide to cry out to him. We read um, in Isaiah 59, 1, uh, Behold, the Lord's hands not shortened, that they cannot save, nor is his ear heavy, they cannot hear, but your iniquities are separated between you and God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. In other words, your arms are too short to bow to God. <laughs> Jeremiah 5.25, you know, harmonizes with this, says, your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholding good things from you. Psalm 68.18 says again, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not heal me. As I've shared before, your heart cannot lie. Your heart's going to tell the truth. And, um, your brain can lie, right? Because you, you can you make conscious choices and, and, and you can justify you know, sin with the, with the enemy. He'll help you justify it. He's really good at that. Um, but we're able to choose life or death. We're able to choose blessings or curses. So it appears to me, so we've got these scriptures about the hearts and just to remind you again, First Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or his height of his stature, because I refuse him, for the Lord seeketh not man as seeketh. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, most people, you, you look around and you judge people by the way they look. That's why God sent me in sometimes. <laughs> kind of upset people's minds and reveal their hearts. <laughs> so the bottom line here is with, without repentance from sin, without turning away from those wicked things, those sinful thoughts, we can't have a proper fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And as long as we continue to fellowship and entertain unclean spirits, we're in trouble. And as long as you continue to entertain spirits of you know, unforgiveness, uh, self bitterness, self hatred, doubt, unbelief, you know, lack of trust in God, um, and his ability to, to heal you and deliver you from anything. As long as you doubt it, you're in trouble. As long as you continue to entertain spirits of accusation and, you know, all, all the, the occultism that we see running around the church today, and godly grief and sorrow, we're critical of each other. We're dead in all trespasses and sins. We, we, we come through repentance. We get our minds renewed. Otherwise, we can't be made alive, alive in Christ without this, right? Um, take you to Ephesians 2, um, Ephesians chapter 2, and this one we see, and you have quickened 
who are dead in trespasses and sin, where in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also you have conversations in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and when by the nature of children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, in his great love here, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace he has saved. And he's raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I think maybe it's time. Some of you get back in your proper seats. Get back in that heavenly place. I mean, the reason God invented repentance is so we can use it, you know, and get free. I mean, the Lord tells us about living a life that's glorifying to Christ. And that means not being worldly, forsaking those things in the world, it's a trap the world. We read about repentance in, in, in Acts 11 18. And when he heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then as God offered to the Gentiles, granted repentance unto life. And see, the moment we turn from sin, we turn to our Savior, who's going to bless us. I mean, isn't that the reason that the Lord had the Apostle Paul preach um, repentance towards God, faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ? In, in Acts 20, uh, 21, we see testifying both of the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance of God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord sent John the Baptist for long, right? To help pave the way for Jesus. And John the Baptist began his ministry saying what? Right. Uh, Matthew 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Jared and saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we've got to face this all together. And what did the Lord Jesus first preach when he went public? Repentance. Um, Matthew 4 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus warned anybody that would listen, anybody that had ears that, to hear, eyes to see, hearts that could be converted, unless you repent, you shall all perish. And it's interesting to observe today that the, the modern popular church message has departed from this basic understanding. This is extraordinary. How do we get there? I mean, just, just believing in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and if that's all that was necessary to get saved for eternity, I mean, I reckon the logical conclusion here is that no one ever needs to repent. And that's, that's the very popular message that's offered up all this false doctrine we're getting now. We read in James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou does well. The devils also believe and tremble. Right? So just because you believe in God, it's not proof that you're justified in faith. Amen. Because the demons believe without justification. And our holy guidebook to the supernatural tells us that the false convert believe, but they're not saved. And in Luke 8, Jesus gives us this parable, but remember this parable, the seeds um, and, and planted and grown, and it shows how the seed is the word of God. When they ask, well, what, what does this mean? The, the seed is the word of God. In, in Luke 8, 13, they on that rock that, that are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, for they for their, while they believe in the time of temptation, fall away. I mean, how many people, like, you know, they have a problem, and what's the first thing? That they run to God, or they run to the doctor, or they run to the lawyer, or they, they run to the, the world. It's sad, but it's true, isn't it? That's what's mm -hmm. going on. Who, who programmed you for that? It's not from the Word of God. I mean, in other words, a, a person who just believes remains a worker of iniquity. You can just, if you just believe, you're still in iniquity. Because you, you're, you're, you're hearing, but you're not a doer of the word, right? James 1, 22, but be a doer of the word, not a hearer, is only deceiving your own self. So we've got a bunch of masses of Christians today, and, and it grieves my heart. It must grieve the Lord this way. Because you've seen all these people gathering this morning, 
and, and they're not really saved. They believe, but they're not saved. I mean, how many people are attending churches, especially the popular modern Tsukumaiya church this morning somewhere? And they fit in this category. They go to church, you have no, no godly changes are happening. They go in and they come out the same way they went in today. And though they profess that they believe that they run after the things of the world. They're deceiving themselves. Thinking they can, they can live in sin and expect to be saved and blessed by the Lord Jesus. Can I give you another scripture? You know they will. Please. First John 2.15 Love not the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we've got many warnings in the Holy Scriptures for, for these examples. First John 1 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't have the truth. It's so in the Old Testament, which is in our instruction in righteousness. We have Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confess and forsake them shall have mercy. So who really wants to confess their sins? I mean, who, who, who would cause you to fear doing such a thing as going before the Lord, knowing everything, that He knows everything about you anyways, right? He knows every detail. And confessing your sins before us throughout the grace and mercy and love. Let's guess what kingdom of darkness is influencing you to not confess these things. I mean, the fact that the Lord says to get healed, we ought to be able to confess our sins before who? Each other. Today it's probably more difficult than the modern churches because if you confess your sins in front of each other, they'll shun you. This is not the church of the scriptures. We've got to get back to that first century understanding, that atmosphere that happened in the, the beginning, get back to the original plan of the God here. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. The factual fervent prayers of a righteous being availeth much. We need to have a safe environment. We can come before God and confess these things. And when you do that, we want to get closer to you. Because you, you're getting real now with the Lord. And you're getting real with each other. I mean, I pray this church and ministry is always a safe place to go and, and confess before the Lord. Considering that the Lord Jesus said that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. We read it in Luke 15.10. Um, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So, I reckon if there's no true repentance, there's no joy because there's no salvation. Now we read about Peter, he preached the day of Pentecost. He instructed all those there to repent for the remissions of sin, right? Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, that must be the, the issue here because a lot of the modern church doesn't want the Holy Ghost. They don't want the gifts. They don't want anything to do with it. Let's be, let's be honest here. That's what's going on. And obviously one of the true gifts, the, the, the true repentance, there's, there's no remission of sin, so there's no gift of the Holy Ghost. That's why nobody's getting healed, nobody's getting saved, no demons are being cast out. What a frustrating place to be. You're more aligned with the Vatican than anything else when you go that way. Peter went on to say in, in Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore be converted, that your sins may be blasted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So are we still under times when God will pour out His wrath? We're still under that time, aren't we? So who can be saved and converted unless we truly repent from our hearts? But God, God commands all people everywhere to repent, and I, that absolutely leaves no exceptions. In Acts 17, 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked yet, but now the command of all men everywhere to repent. I think people still got this American Jesus thing going on, he's winking. 
<laughs> oh, go on, you know, just get on, get, get in there. I mean, throughout scriptures, we read again and again the necessity of repentance for salvation. So it, it, it begs the question, those that preach this multi message of salvation without repentance, can they really lead anybody to Christ? I mean, it, it, it makes it rather suspect, doesn't it? That they themselves are, if they're not preaching repentance, maybe they're not truly converted. I mean, the Lord told us to judge them by the fruit, and just because they gained a lot of popularity, there's no reason to say that's good fruit. I mean, when, when example, when you, you know, you meet somebody from a modern entertainment type church, they appear worldly. Talk to them for a few minutes, they're very worldly. They're very superficial about their faith. They know virtually nothing about casting out demons. They know nothing about healing the sick. And, and most of them, and if I, if I tell them that, you know, 98% of all sickness and disease is actually because you thought, they will argue it. Oh, I don't, I don't believe the it. I go, really? Have you done the research? So you're like a psychic. You know all, you know all the details, you know all the information without ever looking at the research. What did Jesus told his followers in Mark 16, you know, verse 15 and 22? Command spirits to leave in his name, deep, cast out demons, heal the sick, lay hands on them. If that's not happening, you're not here in church. Clearly in the Old and New Testament it says, repent, be saved. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, For a godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repentance of, but the sorrow of the will worketh death. In other words, God's sorrow that works repentance to salvation changes your life. It cleanses you from, from all matter of sin. In Romans, um, Romans 1, 17 says, For there is for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that they may be known of God and to manifest in them, for God has shown them it unto them. For the invisible things, see that people, they just forget there's an invisible world going on. For the invisible things in him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his external power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. I hope somebody on, on the popular you know, message circuit, the modern church, somebody hears this word today, takes it to them. So the whole world's guilty. They're without excuse now for understanding, remaining ignorant of the, the invisible things and its influence that affect us in the visible world. There's no excuse now. Again, we need to take control of our thought life and stop allowing these toxic, toxic thoughts and the demons send you, you give, stop giving them an opportunity to, to, to build a more stronghold in you. Stop listening to the spirit of fear. I mean, there's some very sophisticated image techniques now that can actually show those chemical changes that are, that are happening, that, that are being secreted, that are being squirted out, you know, in those memory trees in the brain. We can see this happening now. So you can, you can actually see what a healthy thought looks like and what an unhealthy thought looks like. And you can trace it to some degree what they do in your body, bodily systems. And keeping in mind those good, healthy memories, you, you engage it and, and you, you reenact, uh, they secrete out good chemicals, they release healing molecules, they bring health and healing. And all those mean, nasty, toxic, faulty memory trees, they hold on to all the bad memories. They're built with spirits of hurt. They're, they're built with spirits of bitterness and, 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 and then they secrete toxic chemicals. And they make they bring sickness and disease. That's how the enemy's doing. We know how he's doing it now. There's no excuse. We know exactly how the enemy does stuff to people now. It's not a mystery anymore. And every time those pre-existing memories are, are reactivated, it's like a wind that blows through the memory trees, and you know, kind of like trees that sway back and forth, 
they're all kind of connected and they're releasing an electrical charge and uh, doing what they go into the hypothalamus gland they're activating emotions that are stored in the library of your mind which is called the amygdala of course in america you say the amygdala <laughs> now i get confused i don't know which way to word it okay um but meaning all, all those emotions that are activated are, are already developed, right? They're already they're, they're, they're stored in your brain, and, and, and they got, you've got, so you've got a lot of pre thousands and thousands and trillions of pre-existing memories, and there's strongholds established in your memories in, in your brain. So, you know, building godly strongholds built on the Holy Scriptures is what we need to be doing here. So you can release, you know, good positive emotions and, and all those chemicals in your body. See, because good fruit is going to do what? It's going to be a blessing. Um, Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So God's ultimate aim for us is in, in, in sanctification in Christ and our relationship with Him and others, part of the sanctification process has to do with the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's just amazing to me how many you know, Christians you run into, they don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they're not even interested. They're missing out. Someone's going to wake them up. And who's going to do that? You are. That's your assignment. That's what God wants you to do. So we get the Holy Spirit baptism transferring nine specific qualities that, that merge into our personalities. And, um, see, God wants to work with every true believer. He wants to equip you. And it's one of the jobs of the pastor to help equip you so you can go do what God's called you to do. You mix the nine fruits with the nine gifts. And we have something happening there. <laughs> one mighty sanctified, holy trained soldier for Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, First Corinthians 12 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To one is given the Spirit the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit to another the faith, by the same Spirit to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues and other kinds of interpretation of tongues. But all these work with one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man's spirit as he wills. So what we got the word of knowledge, we got the word of wisdom, we got the gifts of prophecy, we got um, the gift of faith, we got the gift of healing, we got the working of miracles. We got discerning of spirits. What would you need discerning of spirits for if you didn't have to deal with spirits? <laughs> We've got different kinds of tongues. What you need that for if God didn't want you using it? Mm -hmm. Of course, not the enemy's done everything he can to possibly stop that happening in churches. And, and, and interpretation of tongues. Because God will speak through a body of believers. And, and, and when this happens, we're going to get a word. But usually a word that encourages us to keep going. A word that will be edifying so not only does the Bible tell us these nine gifts are available to all believers, but the Lord actually tells us we ought to stir up these gifts. For example, we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet, um, covet to, to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues. Forbid not to speak in tongues. In other words, we're to desire earnestly to prophesy. We're supposed to desire spiritual gifts. Especially that we, we prophesy. First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1 Follow after charity, which is love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather you may prophesy. First Thessalonians 5 um, 19 says, Quench not the spirit, despite so not prophesying. Somebody needs to tell the modern church this, because apparently it's not in their Bible anymore. <laughs> I mean, anybody notice how most modern churches they come against this? They're coming against God. They're coming against prophesying, so they effectively quench the Holy Spirit from moving amongst them. So you've got a dead church now. You've got a popular church with the dead. The Lord tells us not to neglect the gift that is in you. We're supposed to meditate on the Holy Word and all these things that, that, that He gives us, you know, 
seeking his kingdom first and his righteousness, so all these things could be added on. And First Timothy four, um, First Timothy four fourteen says, "Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery." So how come they don't understand that today? What's happened here? How does this happen? We're, we're, we're to remind each other to stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. Second Timothy one six says, "Wherefore I put." Put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on my hands. I mean, I tell you, I've, I've seen people healed. People come back to me and said, I don't know what it is about you. I get around you, and you know, I'm going to have an allergy now. And I, all I did was put my hand on the shoulder while I was talking to them. I didn't even pray for them. God can do anything He wants because He's God. Thank you, God. So the Lord tells us to do this. These, these are the things we're supposed to do. He warns us that this is a narrow path. And very few don't even find it. So you share the gospel, you know, everywhere you go, mixing your faith with the gospel truth. In Hebrews 7, 4, 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Is that what's going on? The modern church has not heard the, the gospel. First Peter 1 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom ye've not seen him not yet believing ye re rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So fire does what? Fire only, it separates the impurities in gold. When you, when you heat up gold in, in the fire, it takes off the impurities. It doesn't lose its color gold. Mm -hmm. It doesn't lose its weight. It doesn't lose its, 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 its nature being gold. Genuine faith is also proved the same way. So you're going through a fire. Because... Faith in Christ makes you a new creature, gives you personal confidence. The strongest your faith in, in those that you know see Jesus Christ in the flesh and got the same faith they had when they were with him. How extraordinary that the God would do that, would connect us in such a way. It's no different for us than two thousand years ago when they saw him in the flesh. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So, all things passed away. That's a progressive statement. You're being sanctified. So, stop holding on to those old things. You don't need them anymore. And all things that are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, has given us to the ministry of reconciliation. We see in Romans five five, and hope maketh not ashamed, because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So, how are we supposed to deal with these issues when we engage in daily battles? The enemy's doing battle with us every day. Trying to lure us into sin. Anybody notice yet? Yeah. How often are you trying, are the enemy trying to lure you into sin? Even this morning, when you got up. First thing in the morning, very first thought, what was it? The negative strongholds, those, thor those toxic thorny memory trees that are capable of activating some very strong emotions. And, and it's like a spirit of fear can bring you. He's got a variety of, you know, of things in his arsenal that mess with you. So that fear, that unloving spirit, along with the spirits of bitterness and, and anger, uh, envy and jealousy, doubt and unbelief, they, they rise up and they, they check out stuff in your library, in your mind. Go in, go in the amygdala. You need to go out there. They go in there and, and shaking them out. So now, see, you, you, you probably already observe and experience that all these toxic emotions, they're very, very real. They, they, can, they can even resurface years and years later. How amazing. After an event, years later, you're still dealing with an event that happened, you know, when you were two years old, or five years old, or ten years old, twenty years old. For example, you, you think about how that person in the past hurt you, how they caused you pain, 
at the times of suffering you experience as a result of that experience. <coughs> because of pre-existing toxic thorny memory trees built along with the spirit of unforgiveness, the bitterness and helps reactivate that electrical type of wind that comes and blows through the, the memory trees and the corresponding negative emotions. And then they start secreting all the stuff into the, the bloodstream from the library of your mind. And then it alters your perceptions. Now things don't look so good. Things look the same as they did a few minutes ago, but suddenly your emotions say, no, it doesn't look so good. Who's doing that to you? Let's guess. So it alters your perceptions. It causes you to feel like, you know, you're not very blessed. You're not in a very blessed state of mind now. That's a work of the devil. Amen. So what's going on in your body then? It, 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 you're, you're so wonderfully designed and created, and you're able to communicate with your... It, it's, your body can communicate with itself, with all these different levels, with your spirit and your soul, because you control your brain. Your brain doesn't control you. However, the enemy of your soul is coming along and uses this against you. It's trying to use it against you, trick you, and deceive you. So all that information is being communicated through those emotions, through those molecules that carry the emotion. And they carry a feeling, they carry, um, they, actually they create, a, they create a copy or, or an imprint of the memory and, and that's being released and flowing throughout your, your bloodstream. And then they're able to, to, to bind to the receptors of the, the cells in your body and cause you to experience the phys and physically, and then you start to physically feel this thing. You, you feel that, 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 that spirit, you know, will cause you to feel the anger, to feel the, the bitterness, that type of emotion that quickly or quickly happen, all right? Just overtake you suddenly, right? Somebody says one word that can trigger it. In a similar way, you might feel a rush of adrenaline you know, when you're, you're driving and suddenly you see police lights flashing behind you. Whatever. You can feel the chemicals, right? You just feel it. This sort of bad feeling that happens when you're confronted with a, a negative information or a, a negative situation, and um, all of a sudden it's like a, a moment of dread comes over you. So you can imagine how, thinking a thought, Imagine how many, you know, it's causing all these chemical reactions to take place in your entire body. Because you're reacting to the thought that's replaying, you're replaying it mentally and physically, you know, it's causing a reaction all over you. See, as if you could cause a different ending. That's, people, you know, they're having these thoughts and they're thinking how they could have changed it. If only I should have. That's, that's toxic when you go there. That's the enemy going, you know, you could have, uh, you should have done. See, now you're in big trouble because he didn't, he's lying to you. See, the toxic is, is replaying something negative as if it's gonna come out differently. So research in, in like in the science of epigenetics, it shows that when you, when you deeply think and you imagine and you visualize something, it produces the same physical reaction in your brain as if you're actually carrying out and doing the very thing that you're imagining. That's scary. You better start imagining what it's like in heaven. <laughs> See, Jesus told us, if you so much lost after a woman, you've committed spiritual adultery with her. He knew this all along. Science is just catching up. So science is showing you when, you, when, when you're imagining doing something that pretty much you, you, exactly the same brain areas, the same, the same circuits in your brain are activated as if you're actually doing that activity for real. That's what the Lord said all along, Matthew 5, 28. So the Lord gave us imagination to be used for his glory, not for the devils. And who's in control of that imagination? You are. We read in Genesis um, eleven six, and the Lord said, "Behold, the people is one, and they have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do." Your imagination is powerful. 
So we really need to start see, see yourself and imagine yourself the way the Lord sees you. See other people the way the Lord sees them. What a difference it would make today and every day. And when an uncomfortable thought or feeling comes, we've got to speak the word of God out loud. Impossible. And comrade that feeling, that thought, so the enemy doesn't get a, a, a foothold. If you don't, if you don't accept a negative, toxic thought, it's it just kind of like hot air, it just escapes, it's gone. You don't, you don't build up any proteins and bad memory trees. Studies are showing that, brain schemes are showing that the same part of the brain is activated when in physical reactions, the same part is activated by simply thinking about doing that action. So what you think about the most is going to grow the most, and, and the more you imagine and meditate on the Word of God, and, and, you know, that's the thing. You see a lot of Christians go into popular places, and then you talk to them. They're not meditating on the Word of God. They don't even preach the Word over there anymore. They don't even know what the Word is. This is concerning. It's very concerning. So when this takes place, when you don't understand this business of practicing, taking every thought captive, say, the obedience of Christ, say, in uh, Corinthians 10.5, you, you find yourself wanting to respond to those toxic thoughts. Now you want to respond to them, you know? You, you, you're like, the bully's got his hand over your forehead, and you're swinging it up. You're not going to hit him. He's bigger than you, right? Messing with you. It's the same kind of image we get here. So all the, the people responding, the, 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 you know, responding impulsively, they, they immediately re react to the emotional feeling trying to overtake them. I mean, have you ever said and done something because you felt put off or angry, and how did it turn out? You kind of remember like some old films, you know, uh, the war films in, in England, and uh, the, the soldier's best friend gets killed, and the guy just jumps up there and pulls but he goes, you took Johnny out, now I'm going to get you, and before he even fires a shot, the enemy takes him out. Right? Impulsive. Jesus wasn't impulsive when he, he got that whip and came in and overturned the money changes. He wasn't impulsive. He wants us to think about what we're thinking about. So when you go down with these feelings rather than the will of God, you're headed for trouble. Because even though your emotions feel like they're based on truth, they're actually based more on your perceptions of what you think the truth is. That's why you need to study the words so you know what the truth is. So there's no doubt. So to avoid doing future things like that, you've got to stand back and analyze your emotions. Based on the word of God before you react to anything. Asking the Holy Spirit, you know? I mean, asking the Holy Spirit, what would, what would Jesus do is a, is a good thing to start. That's, you know, they used to have those bracelets. Mine just says, keep looking up. But, <laughs> but you know, that, what would you, that's a good idea. What would he do? And then do that. Go with the word of God. Amen? Because yeah. this is literally nothing that we can't ask the Lord about. There's nothing you can't talk to him about. So the Holy Spirit can give you a word of knowledge. He can change everything in an instant. He can change your life today. He can radically change everything for the good. The Holy Spirit can give you a word of knowledge about how to handle you know, something that you're currently dealing with. If you were to knowledge to help bless, us, bless somebody else that you're talking to. John 14, 13 says, And whatsoever we shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So there's no limit on what we can ask as long as we meet his requirements. So you, you just do everything with Christ's love. It can't go wrong. See, with our own knowledge, our, our knowledge is limited. We're limited on this side here. Does anybody understand that we are limited? No matter how brilliant you are, you, you can have an IQ higher than Einstein. You're still limited compared to God. We all need our words and knowledge from the Lord, some kind of regular basis in our life that we can live a life that's glorifying the Christ so we can fulfill our destiny here. So since you're, you're the only unique you that there's ever going to be, there's never going to be another you. Even the clown you, it's still not going to be you. 
You're, you're incredibly unique. An incredible gift from God. And the other thing is that you, got, you can't ignore or bury those emotions that you're feeling either. That's not going to work. In response to those, those, those memory trees in your mind, you know, keeping that stiff upper lip doesn't work so well, believe me. I have a lot of people in England that need ministry right now. Because you grew up with, I'm not going to show any emotions. I'm just bury it inside. I just hold it all inside. What is that going to do? It's going to come out someplace. It's going to mess with your eternal organs. That's the first place it's going to do. And then, you know, it's going to come out like a volcano. Maybe a stag attack one day. You see, it's the little things, it's the little tiny things that, that build up. It's not the big things, it's those little things that stack up. And that's what takes people down. You know, it's like the scroll that broke the keyboard back thing. So in Song of Solomon, it says, uh, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, the vines of ten grapes. So it's a bunch of little foxes that ruin the whole thing. For example, somebody's trying to overcome the spirit of anger. They feel stressed from dealing with things going on in their life and in their office, at home, at work, and, and they're driving home. And then in the rush hour traffic, right? Somebody slams, you know, um, causes them to cut them off and they slam on their brakes. And what do they do? They, they burst into, you know, a fit of rage. We hear about road rage. How would God have you behave? Well, praise the Lord. I got to stop my car in time before I had an accident. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I pray for that person to get better driving skills. <laughs> yes, Lord. You know, if you can admit it, say, Lord, I, I'm feeling angry right now. That was not cool the way they just did that. But I know that losing my patience is not a good thing for my body, right? That's terrible. And, um, so I replaced that. That, that emotion with a very logical, rational decision and stay in a peace of God. Now, I, I know I wrote about this and what was I thinking, that you got something called the IgA level, um, which, which is an antibody that's created as the first line of defense um, against any evading infections. And, and so keep in mind that your immune system is, is designed to work for you, right? So. Um, you won't be susceptible to infections and diseases and that sort of thing. So it's interesting to see that an individual that experiences an episode of, of, of anger for just five minutes, you just get angry for five minutes. You know, most guys go, well, it's, 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 uh, I get angry and then it's over, you know. Well, so is the new trombone. Look at the devastation of this. Okay, so what you're doing to your body Maybe you've understood what this is doing. You get angry for five minutes, your IgA level drops 55% uh, percent in the first hour. That's not good. That's not good, that's not healthy. And it stay below normal for over uh, six hours. For just five minutes of anger and frustration, was it worth it? It wasn't worth it. However you respond as a child of God, if you're a child of God, you should be one all the time. Act like one every time. All the day, all the day long, right? Mm -hmm. All the day and all the night, child of God. Um, sorry, so you feel the song coming out. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Here's that spirit that keeps sounds of me, okay? <laughs> all right. But if you experience an episode of deep appreciation and love for only five minutes, your IG level rises up 40%. And it stays that way for, you know, it's elevated for six hours. That's a good place to be in the love of Christ. See, Proverbs 17, 22, powerful. A merry heart does good like a medicine. But a broken spirit tries to bind us. So now the thing, we, we, we serve the Lord. And we serve the Lord and He's supernatural. So we come into agreement and, and, and understanding. That being rational and making rational, you know, includes being in the supernatural. Being rational is part of being in the supernatural. Because we expect, I mean, I'm rational, and I expect signs and wonders and healing and miracles to follow me as I follow Christ, because that's what he said, that's rational. And it happens, and when you walk in that confidence, you can pray for people, knowing God's going to do something, and he does it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So basically, that part of your brain, with 
where the, the library of your life is kept, the, even the God that it stores and collects all the emotions with which direct communication, you know, connected with it, it connects with your, your um, uh, prefrontal cortex. And your prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that causes you to help you make rational decisions. It helps you analyze all the information that's coming in and out. It literally helps advise the emotional part of your brain um, what to do. So tell, okay, here's what here's the plan, okay? Here's the rational plan. It's like my wife says done for years. Gonna get rational with me. <laughs> Listen, you artist type, we gotta get rational here. Okay? <laughs> so so here you are, you're having this conversation with yourself, and you're processing all the information that's coming in, and your prefrontal cortex comes along to help you deal with the emotions. So your, your prefrontal cortex is, is more willing to help you, um, you know, replace, it's gonna, it wants to help you replace the toxic, the negative, the, the emotional perceptions which, with, with logical, rational decision making. This is a good thing that God gave us. So, you, you, you can simply come to the conclusion that it's best to wait on the Lord and, and, and let the Holy Spirit guide you through whatever it is, you know. Keep in mind that the Lord always leads gently, gently leads you to the truth, and the enemy's driving you. He's like, he's got a whip, he's like driving you into stuff. Don't be driven. Over and over, God, you know, that purpose-driven life, I'm sorry. God doesn't say to do that. He's not driving you. But then it is kind of cool to get in with the Lord drive, you know? You'd be the passenger, okay? So we're gonna make um, rational decisions here because we become rather reactive to emotions. What happens? The enemy dominates your thinking. When you just get emotional, the enemy's right there to help dominate your, your decisions. And then that's never a good thing. And when we're, when we're acting impulsively out of anger, things don't turn out so well. I remember when I was in college, the uh, psychology course, and they, and they had um, uh, case studies where they had these athletes think of something really angry and then try to throw the ball in the hoop, and they couldn't do it. And the guys were just were like at peace, you know, they, they hit it every time. But as soon as they got, they, just, they were talking about some event that really got them to see it, and they just, and then they mess up. And that's what's going to happen. You can't act out of anger. Um, so it's really, I think it's really important to imperatively realize how your thoughts impact each other's thoughts. All these thoughts are connected. Because only you can control your thought life. But then unwanted thoughts are taking you over like a wildfire destroying you. know, wildfire comes and destroys everything in this path. So look, you can't really control the weather. You can't uh, control events in your life and circumstances, you know, that happen every day. I mean, unless you're, you know, belong to, you're a member of Harvard in Alaska. <laughs> not to say them all. Um, but, I mean, even if you could, you can't really control the outcome. They can't, they, they can, you know, mess with the winds or whatever they're doing, but they still can't control the, the outcome because that belongs to God. But if you're a child of God, you're going to face each day all the circumstances and, and act like one all the time. See, Proverbs 25, 28 says, He that has no rule over his own spirits, like a city broken down without walls. That means anything can come and go as it pleases doesn't even need a passport. It could leave a mess anywhere it wants because it has total freedom to come and do whatever it wants. And most, you know, most people don't understand how to take the thoughts here. And most churches don't teach it also. So what's happening? It's a mess. And the thing is that all our thoughts are so intricate with other thoughts in our brain. Now, back in England, you might see some lovely branches of ivy. You know, as I would go places, you know, was ivy grown on, on all of these old established buildings. And then you might see some of the ivy stalks, um, some of them become black and they shrivel up because some nasty insects, some bacteria um, is joining the stem of that ivy. It started out in you know, little green spots and it turned into black and brown and it caused damage to the ivy plant. I'm using that as a parable. 
So in a way we get all our, 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 all our thoughts are connected like ivy. I was thinking about this last night. All our thoughts are just like a, an ivy on, on growing on a building. We gotta we have to keep weeding out those, those nasty toxic ones. Get them out of there before they do damage. Before they go against the word of God. Keeping in mind, you know, contrary, it's contrary to popular opinion, the Holy Word of God and the latest scientific research reveals that the link between thoughts are determined by you. Because the Lord designed us with the ability to design our own brain, our, our own brain essentially. So we get to choose this day who we're going to serve moment by moment. It's a moment by moment decision. Who are we going to serve right now? In other words, this means that when you, you think about a particular thought, that thought actually receives an invitation, or it's like a signal to move from your subconscious mind into your conscious part of your mind. Because it's, 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 it's a particular thought that takes up actual real estate in your brain. And because, you're, because through the, the principles of quantum physics is showing that you're, you're dealing with a real force, real particles, real wave-like behavior, interactions of energy, you know, and, and, and matter. This is, this is a reality that's happening in our brains. So the Lord probably designed science as a way of showing just how awesome creation is. So I want to I'll design science and you guys are going to understand how incredible this whole thing is. This world that I created for you. I mean, how many people have bought into this idea that you're a product of your, your family heritage? You're just a product of the sinful patterns and, and habits. You're just really, you know, a victim controlled by genetics and biology. So you might as well forget about your dreams and visions for a better life. What does the Word of God say about this? I mean, that's what the world's view of it is, right? You just, that's just the way you are. So it may give you... Submit for your approval here. Second Corinthians three eighteen. But we all, with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even the Spirit of the Lord. I dare say that's some incredible, encouraging news today. We need to share that. I mean, if, if you spent most of your life, this is amazing. If you spend most of your life building <coughs> negative thoughts in your brain, just say, just say you did. I'm just guessing maybe some of you might have done some of this, right? You, you built up some negative thoughts, and you've been helping the devil to build these sinful strongholds. So today you might actually have a whole forest of toxic, thorny memory trees in your brain. I've got awesome news. Because, see, God could do anything. I got awesome news. In, in as little as four days, just taking proper control over your thought life, just practicing your thoughts, you can begin to eliminate those nasty um, thinking patterns. You replace them with what God thinks about it. Significant changes happen in your brain in 12 days. I mean, we got the science to show how this changes. So in 21 days, of consistently working on thinking on what you're thinking about, you can remove those those thorns off the toxic thorny memory trees, and you can create new and build healthy memories over them. This is really important pay attention, okay? So, for example, you hear yourself saying, "Now, if only I did," and you can fill in the blank, right? What if I should have? Only if I would have, should have. Something should have happened. Something should have happened. It didn't happen. It should have happened. And that's all kind of toxic, rooted in fear. So you catch yourself saying that. Stop. In the name of Christ, before you break your heart. Right? And, 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 and then you, you, you understand that you, you catch yourself and you choose not to allow these ungodly thoughts to control your future thoughts, your future right now. And, and, and you do what Jesus did. You quote scripture back to the devil. Properly. See, he always misquoted it. He misquoted scripture, the, the, the Lord, and he just said, no, this is what it really says, right? Isaiah 43, 18 says, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. So stop letting the enemy bring up this rubbish from the past and try to hold you down with it. Romans 1, 8, therefore there is no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirits. So if you've got an NIV, pay attention here. <laughs> who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Hebrews um, 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you thought you were alone. You're not alone. Okay, it's a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, every sin and sin which clings so closely, and let us run the endurance of the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We see in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not I, but Christ live in me. And the life which I live is in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself to me. So the things here is that you can literally detoxify your brain. You can change all the, the neurochemical structure by taking charge of your thought life. I can't do it for you. God's not going to do it for you. You can do it. You control your brain. Your brain doesn't control you. So, for example, if you decide to reject those sinful thoughts, the, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the anger, the envy, the jealousy, the fear, the fear of the future. Oh, what are we going to do? The fear of the future. Remember when, when, when the New World Order was just a conspiracy theory, now it's here? Okay. <clears throat> so, God's still more powerful. Hallelujah. Right? So, through genuine repentance, releasing all those that have done you wrong, forgiving them, including yourself, you can actually change that memory and, and the structure of those thorny memory trees. This is amazing. This is where the scientific research has proven the Holy Buddha called in laboratories. Because it, it's been scientifically proven that, that if you choose to reject those toxic thoughts and do what the Lord said instead and, and, and just meditate on His Word day and night, it brings healing to all your flesh. And purposely meditating on what is good, whatsoever is true, whatsoever honest, whatsoever just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever lovely, whatsoever of good report, if you have any virtue, if praise, think on those things. And the word of God causes actual chemical chemicals to be released as we do this. And, and they flow through the thorny memory trees. They literally they remove the the nasty thorns, they, they tear down the thorns. And for example, if you, when you repent of entertaining a spirit of bitterness and you forgive all those that hurt you and did you wrong, and then the chemicals that are released, they, 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 they tear down the, the, the thorns. And, and, and I mean, you're always going to remember the offense. It doesn't erase the memory, but it takes the thorns off there because of the love of Christ. That awesome love, that, that memory tree bitterness no longer is able to make you sick. Amen. And no longer able to cause diseases to happen because you no longer have thorns that release toxic chemicals into your bloodstream. You get this? You understand? This is really important. So when, when you think of that person or that situation where you got wounded in the past and you're no longer feeling that feeling of dread and pity in your stomach when, when it comes up, when how you acting, being, you know, it goes off. Whereas before, you know, you went to the Lord's throne of mercy, grace, and love, you had to deal with it, and now you don't. Because that, that literally tore down the, the, the thorns off the toxic tree. It, it rendered it useless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, in a way, we, we, this way we, we can, you know, in any situation where you're entertaining ungodly thinking, we can change that. We can eliminate all the toxic falling memory trees and all the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the low self-esteem, the guilt, the shame, the self-hatred, the anger, the jealousy, all that kind of stuff. When you make a decision to reject those thoughts, no, 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 that's not God's that way of doing it. I'm not going there. God's going to honor that. I'm going to stay in faith. But when you do that, and, and, and um, you're tearing down those toxic thought, thought trees, you're building healthy memories over them. And science, the process is actually called um, retranscribing those memories neuro, um, neuroplasticity. So you throw that around the next part of yet. 
Here we retrace, retranscribing his memory neuroplasticity. Okay. That just means renewing your mind. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's not asking for something unreasonable here. He's asking for a reasonable service. That if you're a Christian, you belong to him. It's reasonable for him to ask. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and be proved what is good and acceptable and perfect with a God. This in Ephesians 4.23 says, Be renewed in your spirit of your mind. Constantly be renewing your mind, spirit, having, having fresh mental, spiritual attitude, godliness. Your, your brain has an incredible capacity to change, to rewire itself, to, to, to grow, to heal. You can literally remodel your, the memories of your brain to changing your thinking. Let's pray. Let's just pray all together. Let's say, Father God, Father God, I understand, I understand what you're saying here. What you're saying here. I need to change some things I've been thinking about. I need to change some things I've been thinking about. Think about them the way you think about them. So right now I renounce in my generation. So right now I renounce in my generation. All the way back to Adam. All the way back to Adam. And I repent. And I repent. I renounce in my life with fellowshipping. With any unclean spirits. With any unclean spirits. Even this day. Even this day. I renounce and repent in my life. For all spirits of condemnation. And gossip. Memory, accusation, accusations towards you, towards you, myself or others, myself or others, for entertaining the spirits of bitterness, and any of its underlings, for all, all the wrong thoughts that I've imagined, for all the wrong thoughts that I've imagined, and I understand now how they cause chemical reactions in my body. And I now how to so help me, Lord, not to do it again. So help me, Lord, not to do it again. And I thank you, Father God, so I thank you, Father God that I can be released this day. That I can be released this day. From toxic thinking. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ of Israel. Because of what you accomplished, Lord, on the cross. You accomplished the, cross. the cross. The finished work of Jesus. I just thank you, Father God, for setting me free. In the name of Jesus Christ of Israel. Messiah Yeshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, Father God, as one of your representatives, I, I speak right now to any of those unclean spirits that just been named. I command them to come up and I'll go to the dry place. And I, I thank you, Lord, that I have the authority to cancel their assignments right here, right now. I thank you for releasing healing molecules into my brothers and sisters. And I thank you, Father God, we have the power to bind and break the powers of darkness and the spirits of criticism uh, and every unclean spirit that would come up against any of us. And I thank you, Father God, that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises against us in judgment is already condemned because this is the heritage for your children. And I thank you, Father God, for, for releasing us now to your supernatural peace. And then we can be rational thinkers in, in, in your supernatural realm. And I thank you, Father God, that your, your word is clear. As children of God, we've been given the fruits of the Spirit. We've been given joy, peace, and love in the Holy Ghost. And that's all we're willing to walk in. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible joy and love to overtake us now. Thank you for helping us overcome any spirit of fear of the future. Of, um, whatever's going on in the world governments, whatever's going on in the universe, with all the lying signs and wonders, UFO manifestation, whatever is going on, Lord, we know that you're going to take care of us. So we put our complete trust in you. In the Almighty name of Jesus Christ and Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua, and all the saints said, Hallelujah, Amen. Amen. Amen.